perfect. Yeah. All right. All right. Good. Good. Good connection. Good connection. All right, Mr. Wilson. Well, I would say thank you very much for joining me. It's a, certainly a pleasure to have you here on Second Chance Leadership. Second Chance Leadership is a podcast, a uh, podcast about leadership. It's about leadership and leaders and what they're doing in their community, uh, whether they are leading their homes, whether they are leading an organization, uh, whether they're leading a, a small men's group or whatever. It's all about leadership. How do you go about leadership in your daily life? Uh, I want to thank you and, and, and show my appreciation because this is about the first podcast that I've done in about six months. I've been on a little bit of hiatus, so uh, I look forward to storming back with you and, uh, and, and hearing about your story, your journey, and uh, what it is that you're doing now to be a leader in your community. With that being said, uh, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and uh, what space you're in and what you're currently doing. Okay, so my, my name is Brian Wilson. Uh, I'm currently a student at the University of Baltimore. Uh, what, what brought me to this journey was I, I, I'm one of the formerly released students. Uh, I made some poor choices when I was 15 years old and it landed me in prison for 15 years. But, you know, through the, the, the opportunity of the Second Chance Pell Grants, it allowed me an opportunity to, you know, pursue college. And, you know, two years of that, I came home and everything has been smooth sailing. So I had, I switched my major to business marketing because I wanted to be able to offer something to the at-risk youth because it's sometimes difficult when you, you tell them, hey, try something new. And then they're saying, well, what, what can you show me that I, you know, you have to offer an alternative. So I wanted to be able to offer them an alternative to the things that they're doing. So I switched to business administration. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Mr. Wilson is speaking of Second Chance Pell Grant, which is a, um, a new, I guess officially they call it an experiment, but it is a program that uh, President Obama signed back in the law during his tenure as president. And now Second Chance Pell Grant is going through reauthorization and we are trying, we, uh, society, as well as a, a, a group called Vera, who is spearheading uh, this whole initiative, uh, trying to get that reauthorized and make sure that we have enough money in this program so that we can give uh, humans like Mr. Wilson an opportunity to have this second chance that we speak of. Uh, we all know that we uh, that everyone deserves a second chance and another opportunity to to maximize and live their full potential in life. So we are gracious that he had an opportunity to uh, go to school uh, while, uh, while incarcerated uh, and then uh, come out and become a productive citizen. With that being said, uh, tell me what your definition of success is, Mr. Wilson. My definition of success is, is it's not really mainstream because I, I see everything as a success, even my failures. You know, because as, as long as you're learning and you're not giving up, to me, that's my definition of success is, is to never let, you know, trying obstacles shoot you down and have you in that kind of defeated moment. You know, so as long as you're continuously pushing forward and you're learning, you're motivated, I think that's a success story right there in and of itself. Yeah. Perseverance is, is everything. Uh, Absolutely. All of us, all of us get down. Uh, all of us have obstacles in our way, in our path, where, where we uh, may not have an opportunity to live our best life or the life that we thought we were entitled to. Uh, but if we, if we muster up enough perseverance and keep going, we have an opportunity to, to do all the things that we could do or can do and possibly should do. So uh, once again, thank you for, for being that wonderful example. Just curious, do you have like a favorite leadership quote or something that gets you through the rough and tough times? Uh, I do. I, I believe it's by Michelangelo. He said that the, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we reach it, but that our aim is too high. Oh, let me rephrase that. I'm sorry. The greatest danger <laughs> for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that our aim is too low and we reach it. You know, and, and the reason I, I love that quote so much is because I believe that 
as a people, we sometimes aim for the lower marks. And then when we reach those lower marks, we consider it success, but we're never really pushing ourselves to our fullest potential. So I, I think that the reason I apply that to me and that I love it so much is because there's a huge danger in that. Because if you're never reaching your full potential, then you never know who you truly are. Wow, that's deep. That's deep. If you're never reaching your full potential, you never know who you are. I totally agree with that. Uh, I think a lot of times, especially in society today, uh, have a lot of time, uh, have a great opportunity to work with a lot of high school students and even a lot of students in, in my program. And I think a lot of times we get uh, distracted by all the different shiny things in the world today. Um, and, and we lose our focus, we lose our hindsight. And so we, we're happy with mediocre. We're happy with just barely making it. Um, this, this Second Chance Pell Grant is a new lease on life, is the way that I like to look at it. It's a new way to go about things and, and, um, and capture this moment instead of reflecting back on what possibly happened in the past or, or what, what uh, your mother did or what your father did, we have an opportunity to go out and capitalize and live our best life. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are doing that. So I think a lot of times we get in our own way as a society. Uh, we, we, our, our own mental uh, acuity, it limits us, <clears throat> excuse me, in a lot of things that we do. So uh, I, once again, just appreciate you coming on today, sharing your story. Uh, and we're gonna get this word out so a lot of people can hear this and can be inspired by the great work that you're doing. Uh, even though uh, life happens and it happens quick and sometimes it may um, shift us on a different course, uh, take us down a path that we hadn't planned on, uh, there are opportunities if you work high, you keep your, your aim high, um, that you can bounce back and, and do what it is that you were called to do. Uh, talk to me about uh, what's been the biggest failure, challenge, or obstacle in your life uh, today? And, uh, and, and, and how did you overcome it? I think the, it's, it's two of them, actually. One of them, the biggest challenge that, that I had to face was, was learning to forgive myself. You know, because I've, I've done some things in my life that I'm not too proud of. Ultimately, it made me who I am today. But I, I've, I've hurt some people, you know, uh, emotionally. I've, I've done things that, you know, a, a lot of people were frowned down upon. And it, it took me a long time to forgive myself like that. I started, you know, kind of looking the way society looked at me. And when you, when you start to view yourself in that manner, it, it does something to your, to your psyche. You know, so I, I didn't think that I deserved forgiveness. So for a long time, you know, I, I was comfortable being in prison because I had started to believe what society had believed of me. So until I learned to forgive myself, you know, I, I really didn't try too hard to make that change because I, I'd already felt like society had abandoned me and not forgiving myself. I didn't think that I deserved their forgiveness or their support. So that was one of the obstacles. And, and the way I overcame that was just through constant prayers. And my mother was a big support. You know, one thing she used to always say to me, no matter how much trouble I got into, you know, she would always say, you are a great black man in the making, you know, no matter which kind of trouble. I, and, it, and it stuck with me, you know, and eventually I, I learned to forgive myself. And I'm still learning. I learned to forgive myself and I'm still learning every day. You know, there's a lot of people that, I wish I could reach out to some I, I don't even remember anymore. Some I don't have no way of reaching, but I, I wish I could just reach out to them and say, look, I'm sorry. You know, I know I hurt you. I know this happened. I'm sorry. Uh, the other obstacle I faced is society. You know, when you do things that society frowned down upon, it kind of casts a shadow over you, if you allow it. But it's an obstacle more so for society than it is for me because I am going to be who I am. I'm going to be this, this transformed man, this returning citizen, regardless of how society views me. If they see me as the man I am today or the boy that I was yesterday, I'm going to continue to push forward. I'm going to continue to move forward. 
but the obstacle just comes in at constantly, you know, evaluating their perceptions of me. And it's not everybody. It's not everybody, but you know, the, the viewpoints are there and it's understandable to some degree. So that's, that's the second obstacle. Good, good. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you are absolutely right. It is tough, uh, especially for a young black male, uh, when it comes to, uh, what society tells us we are. Uh, and, and if we don't have someone speaking life into us, or if we don't have someone to encourage us, or if we don't have someone who is, is constantly showing us how things can be different than what we visualize on TV every single day, then we fall into that stream. Uh, and, and so that's, that's important to, to hear society but you have have strong enough self-confidence and self-actualization i guess to know who you are as a human being to know that look i'm not gonna fall into that stereotype or i'm not gonna let that stereotype define who i am as a person or as an individual what i'm going to do is to allow myself to grow and develop and take a hold of all the opportunities that i have before me in life and I think that's that's commendable uh, because you're right. There are a lot of people who put labels and attach labels to us and put us in a box and say, hey, this is all you can do, you know, uh, and if you can't run, shoot a 20 foot jumper or if you can't uh, catch um, a post pattern, then you you can't do nothing but go to prison. And that's simply just not the facts. Uh, there's so many different things. There's so many different opportunities. And I appreciate you uh, taking hold of this opportunity and working it uh, to, your, to your advantage. Uh, the first part that you talked about is, is being incarcerated and then you having an opportunity to make sure that you don't become institutionalized. Because uh, I, I think I heard you say that um, prison was comfortable uh, that, that you start, and please correct me if I'm wrong now, uh, that, that you started to, or this is my words now, but that, that you started to kind of live the life and go through the routine. And that was just your pattern. But yet by having an opportunity to get in school and get involved, uh, and be a part of a second chance Pell Grant, you were able to separate yourself from that and make sure that you start doing some different things to make sure you're the one who's who's driving uh, your vehicle of life to decide where you're gonna go and what you wanna be in life and what you want life to be for you and how life is gonna define who you are uh, as a person and also as a black male. Yeah, well, I, I, I would like to clarify that a little bit. I, I didn't mean okay. necessarily in, in terms of like uh, uh, comfortability, but what I was saying is that when you're constantly told that that you're nothing and you're put into these dehumanizing situations because prison by far is not comfortable at all. The food is horrible. The, the, the conditions, the living conditions are horrible. And sometimes you're faced with a lot of, of, a lot of opposition, not just by the other incarcerated citizens, but by the staff as well. But when you when you're put into a cage, because that's what it is. And I want to, you know, define it as it, as it is, you, you start to feel like, you know, there's no other place for you. You know, and that's because there's a huge uh, uh, there's a huge gap between society and the incarcerated citizens. You know, you you kind of just we discard those people, and they 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 are what they are. They're they're human beings who made mistakes, and when you don't feel like you have society support, you kind of just give up on life. And I'm, I was fortunate enough not to have a life sentence, but I have many friends who have life sentences. And they just feel like, you know, the easiest thing for them to do is, is just to give up. To just, you know, accept their fate for what it is. And it, it's saddening. And I, I found myself even in that situation. And I, and I didn't even have a life sentence. Even yeah. with all the horrible conditions that, that, that exist there. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're definitely thankful uh, for that. And that you were able to, to pull yourself up. Um, we are also thankful for that mm -hmm. clarification too, 
uh, I, I'm glad you went back and, and corrected my, 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 my thinking on that. So, so thank you. Talk to me about what was the light bulb moment? When did it click in your mind's eye that, that things can be different? Uh, what was the, uh, I don't say, what, what was the uh, experience? What was the situation? What happened? When did that, that pivot take place? Do, do you remember a particular incident? Um, I do actually. There, there was, you know, in, in prison, there, there's a lot of violent encounters, you know, and, and when you constantly seeing that, I, I was, at the time, I, I had been mentoring for about maybe five years. Because uh, there are some some self help programs in there that you know pretty much is not ran by the the institution or the staff though they allow us to have these programs, and a lot of the incarcerated citizens are mentors there such as myself, and I, I constantly saw a lot of violence and you know when I was looking at those kind of things and I'm seeing all this violence like I, I there has to be something different, you know, and there has to be a way that. I can I can participate in a meaningful experience to help change somebody else's life outside of just a mentoring and be able to offer something meaningful to a lot of the men in there that are, you know, committing these uh these acts to be able to, you know, just better prepare them for society as well as myself, you know, because it's easy to fall into that that the monotony of prison. It's yeah. easy because that's that's all you really see for the most part. The people who, who are doing good, you know, like it's too far and few between. At least it seems that way because so much of the, the, the other things that are uh, happening in prison, it seems more louder than the quiet whispers of someone who's reading a book, you know. So, yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to be, do something meaningful. I just saw too, many, too much violence, uh, too many people who, who want help but don't know where to start. You know, and I've had people come to me, you know, a lot of uh, the younger guys because they you're young men in prison, some of them are juveniles, uh, some of them are, are just turning 18 and 19. Right. But a lot of them would come and they would say, you know, I want to change, but I don't know where to start. And to be able to offer them an answer for that, you know, that, that was really like my light bulb moment. But before I could really give those answers, I had to get the answer for myself because even though I was mentoring those individuals, I still had to figure some of that stuff out for myself. And I had to not only figure it out for myself, but know that it works. Wow. Wow. Uh, just, that was a value bomb right there. So I just want to kind of go back and try to capture that as much as I can. But you said before you could help someone else, you have to help yourself. Absolutely. So you have to start within and then work out. And Absolutely. so I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, I, I think that's phenomenal because I think that's the piece that that we sometimes uh, forget. Uh, I think my preacher was talking about something about uh, the speck in someone's eye. If you don't get the speck out of it, it eventually turns into a plank. And so I, I think that analogy is, is critical because if we don't work on ourselves, and if I don't know who I am, I don't know what makes me tick or what drives me, or why it is that instead of going left, I'm gonna go right. If I don't know where my values are, it's easy to get caught up. Um, got a couple teenagers live in my house. So <laughs> we talk a lot about peer pressure. And are you gonna be a follower? Or are you gonna be a leader? Because if you're a follower, then someone can lead you into a situation that you shouldn't be in. And it's not a, a fact of if you know better or not, it's just the fact of if you're going to have the wherewithal within, if you're going to have the drive to stand up and stand on your own two feet and do what you know is right. So that's, to me, that's that's very valuable. That's very valuable. And then the part also is, and that's part of the reason why I do this podcast, is because I think that we have a duty, we have an obligation uh, just to impart knowledge. Um, you can say teach somebody, uh, but to me, it's just a bigger, just dropping a word, just trying to encourage somebody that uh, you got this, you know, you can do this, you can do this, it, whatever you need to be successful, it's within you. And I think a lot of times, that's what uh, 
people need to hear but don't have an opportunity to hear. So I'm glad to see that there's people out there like yourself who's willing to put themselves out there, to put themselves out there to share with other people um, the message, the message that needs to be shared with all so that everyone can learn and we all can be a part of something greater. It's one stat that I love throwing out, uh, and Vera throws it out all the time, is for everyone in prison, 85%, 85% will be returning home to be your neighbor, to go to church with you, to shop at Walmart with you, to go to Applebee's with you. They're coming back to society, and we have to make sure that we do our part as a society to make sure that we invest in our fellow human being to make sure that they get what they need so that they can capitalize on this second chance and be able to do what it is that they need to do so they can sustain life for themselves, one, and then also utilize their diversity to help make it a better society for everyone uh, to live in. So uh, that's just my little quick little thoughts on that. And, and I just wanna say, I appreciate you, brother. Uh, and, I, and I wanna agree with you on that statistic. and and. That was very great of you to point that out because I think that what society should really start doing instead of looking at the, the past crime and looking at an individual as, oh, he's a, a felon or a convict, a robber, a murderer, I think they should look at it more in terms of, okay, do I want a returning citizen to come home or do I want a returning robber to come home? You know, <laughs> because when you put it in that kind of stark contrast, and I hate to be you know, kind of that, 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 that devil's advocate person. But when right. you put it into that contrast, it kind of makes perfect sense. I want to return a citizen. I don't Absolutely. want, you know, somebody who's going to be potentially robbing me or whatever the case may be. I want someone who's going to come home and be a, product, a productive citizen. A Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes I get into conversations and have a little discourse about, well, y'all providing all those programs for folks who are in prison, uh, my own child can't get uh, a Pell Grant because y'all giving them away to people who have a record. And again, that, that stat is the first stat that I throw out there and say, hey, 85%. And you're absolutely right. Do I want someone who is still proficient in the skill of robbery? Or do I want someone who has basically taught themselves to study and to, and to, um, and to be a productive part of society who's going to return home with this education, who's going to return home with this skill set, who uh, who's able to do all types of things to help create this world and make sure that we are better as a society than what we were before. And, and you know, uh, I want to touch on, I, I can never remember the gentleman's name, but I know he was a returning citizen uh, and I believe he's a doctor now at John Hopkins. So that, that's another interesting point. Like th this guy came home, overcame the obstacles, first of being a, a black man, second of being a, a returning citizen who had just came home from committing a crime. And now this guy's a doctor, right? You know, so that that's also like an interesting point. This man's saving lives. So right. do you want someone who's saving lives coming home or someone with the intentions of taking lives? And there's Absolutely. many people there that want that change, but they need help to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm glad that there's people who believe in this second chance Pell Grant who's able to to give them that that opportunity uh, to to make that change. Um, what is one thing that is exciting to you about your current leadership stance? I have to say helping people, just being able to, to, to offer someone the opportunity or just offering some knowledge, you know, because I, I firmly believe that if I can reach one person out of a hundred, my job is, is complete for that person, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm aware that we might not be able to reach everyone, but if we can reach one person is a butterfly effect. You know, th that small ripple is going to send ripples everywhere else because that right. one person might reach one person and that one person he reached might reach another person. So I, I strongly feel that like that that's my biggest thing is just being able to hear somebody's story. Like when, when we were mentoring, 
uh, a lot of the youth, we would tell them we have rules, we have ground rules. So they couldn't come in the, in the classroom cussing. That was the first thing. So something as small as one of the younger guys coming and saying, you know, I don't even cuss no more. Or when I'm on the phone talking to my family and one of them cuss, I tell them, hey, look, I don't do that no more. Can you, you know, watch your mouth? Like something that small is a joy for me because that's showing that planting those small seeds and you, you watering them, they're growing. You know, so it's not always just that, well, let's throw them in prison and ignore them. Let, let them, you know, rot and die there. Like plant a seed, nurture that seed, and then you'll watch it grow. It might not, it doesn't take a plant to grow in one day. It's a right. course of time that that plant grows. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so tell me, what is it that you see in the future? In the future, I, I definitely see more more involvement with the community. Uh, I definitely I definitely want to do a lot of the things that I was doing while I was there. I, I want to mentor youth. Uh, I plan on. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Safe Streets in Baltimore City. No, I'm not. Okay, they they're an organization that's pretty much geared to violence interruption. You know, kind of like the uh, I think like the Angels of California. Got you. All right, so yeah, I plan on doing some work with them, uh, some work with a few uh, nonprofit uh, programs. A uh, friend of a friend is another one. They do a lot of the community work out there. So I definitely want to be very involved with the community, more so with uh, at-risk youth. So I want to do some speaking at some schools and things of that nature because I, I want to be able to reach them before they hit that pivotal moment in their life and they're making poor decisions that cost them the rest of their life, if not their life. Yeah, they're yeah, awesome. Well, I think you're on the right track. Uh, I commend you again. Uh, I think that is so valuable is to have this given spirit uh, where you want to kind of meet someone at the intersection of life and be able to pour into them so that they can go off and make the appropriate decisions that's going to help him or her. So, so thank you. Um, let me ask you this. I'm going to give you a set of questions uh, in the speed round. And uh, so don't take a long time. I just want okay. the first thing that pops in your head. Okay. So talk to me. What is holding you back from being a world-class leader? Uh, I don't think nothing's holding me back at this point. I, I think that I, I'm continuously pushing forward. No, nothing can hold me back. And as my mother says, you know, I don't let grass grow under my feet. <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, what was the best leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, to never give up. That's that's the best advice, you know. And as you mentioned earlier, perseverance. Like that's one of my two favorite P's: patience and perseverance. Just keep right. pushing. I hear you. I hear you. Is there a particular book that you would recommend to uh, Second Chance Nation? Hmm. A favorite book, How to Be a Brilliant Thinker. It was a book that I read for one of our business classes, but it just basically challenges, you know, a lot of the assumptions we hold. Love it. I might have to get that one myself. So imagine you woke up tomorrow in a brand new world, which was kind of similar to Earth, but you knew no one. Uh, would you, but you still have all the experiences that you have amassed today and all the knowledge that you currently have. Your food and shelter is taken care of, but all you have is a laptop and five hundred dollars. What would you do? Well, the first thing I want to try to do is figure out how to turn that five hundred dollars into a million plus dollars in a legitimate way. And I know <laughs> it can go. be done because you have a lot of small startups that you know was 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 founded, like Disney, for example, was founded in a, in a garage. So it can be done. I'll figure out what the community needs and, and, and push forward from there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, Mr. Wilson, this uh, concludes our interview uh, with Second Chance Nation. Again, I just want to say, hey, keep pushing for the stars, my brother. Make sure you don't set that bar low, which I can tell already. You got it high, high, high. Make sure that you continue to live your best life and make it even better. I look forward to uh, watching you uh, as you grow, and I look forward to hearing all the wonderful things that you're doing for yourself, for your family, but also for other young boys and girls of Baltimore. I've been to Baltimore many times, 
watched The Wire many times. So uh, <laughs> I, I know that's not an accurate depiction, uh, yeah. at least in all places in Baltimore. <laughs> but, uh, but Baltimore is definitely a place that needs you and that can use you, someone of your mindset and someone also of your skill set who's willing to do the work. And that's what I always say. You know, is it a is it a capacity issue or is it a skill issue? And I don't think it's either one in your situation. You definitely have the skill set to go forward and and share the word, share your word with others. And the capacity is definitely there as well. I can see that you are destined uh, for great things. So continue to do what you do, my brother. Keep your head high, uh, even if a, a barrier. Or mm -hmm. a hurdle gets in your way, don't let it stop you. Always continue to push forward and and do and do the work of greatness. Um, I I tell my my my, my personal kids that there's probably five percent difference between good and great. Now, do you want to be good or do you want to be great? You know, it's about doing those little things that no one else is willing to put the work in to do. Willing to roll your sleeves up and get busy. So um, so thank you. Thank you for everything. Uh, I'm going to leave you with the last word. If there's a, a, a little nugget of information or wisdom that you want to drop on us, uh, I certainly do appreciate you and, and everything uh, that you have done. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Appreciate your story. Appreciate you being an active participant in the Second Chance Pell Grant. Uh, hopefully we're going to get this thing reauthorized. And there's going to be many more folks such as yourself who's going to have an opportunity uh, to capitalize on a new lease on life. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you, T, for offering me this opportunity. And I would like to thank, you know, everybody involved with the Second Chance Pell Grants. I uh, give a shout out to my professor, Dr. Cantoria and uh, uh, Latonya Epps uh, from the University of Baltimore. But the jewel I want to leave is, is paraphrasing Nelson Mandela. When he says, you know, who are you to not shine your light on the world? You know, I, I want people to always think of themselves as that shining light. No matter how many dark days you have, you know, you are a beacon of hope. As long as you have breath, as long as you have, you know, the power to fight, continue to push forward. And patience and perseverance is your key, you know, and you'll see, you'll see your growth. You'll see your progress and you'll also see that nothing can stop you. Awesome. Awesome. Great word to end on. Second Chance Leadership Nation, I just want to say thank you. This is uh, Devon Carson signing off along with Brian Wilson from Be More. Uh, we just want to thank him for his time, thank him for his story, uh, and we just want to encourage him to continue to move forward and be that beacon of light to others. Once again, thank you, Second Chance Leadership.